Hi, Terry Shanefeld for UAB School of Medicine. Odds ratios and relative risks are the main measures of association in observational studies. In this video, I'll discuss how to interpret what they mean and importantly, how to apply them in the care of our patients. So the outcome measures in observational studies are a relative risk or risk ratio in cohort studies and an odds ratio in case control studies. Let's look at each of these individually. So relative risk or risk ratio is just that, it's a ratio. And in the numerator we have the incidence or rate of development of disease in the persons who are exposed divided by the incidence or rate of developing disease in those who were not exposed. And a relative risk or risk ratio expresses how many times more or less likely an exposed person is to develop the outcome relative to an unexposed person. And the key here is relative, as we'll see in a minute. How do we interpret this? Well, if our relative risk is 1, there's no risk of the outcome because the numerator and denominator are exactly the same. The relative risk is greater than 1. That means there's increased risk of the outcome in exposed persons. If the relative risk is less than 1. That means reduced risk of the outcome in exposed persons. So let's see how we interpret a relative risk. In this case, I want you to interpret what a relative risk of 1.36 means. Pause the video, look through these answers, choose the one you think is correct. Restart the video and see what my answer is. So let's see how you did. What did you choose? Well, a relative risk goes along with a cohort study, and cohort studies look at risk of disease. So anything here that has exposure in it can be thrown out immediately. Next, the relative risk is 1.36, which is greater than 1, so that means risk is increased. So I have one answer that says risk was reduced, so I can get rid of it completely. So now I'm down to two answers. And this is a useful formula to figure out this answer. The relative risk increase or relative risk reduction is the absolute difference between 1 minus relative risk, and then you multiply it by 100. And so because my relative risk is 1.36, I know I have to calculate a relative risk increase. And when I run my numbers through, I know my answer should be number 5 or 36%. So relative risk of 1.36 means risk of disease is 33 or excuse me, 36% greater in exposed persons relative to unexposed persons. So remember this formula, it's something you'll need um, both for your step exams, etc., but also importantly um, in clinical practice. So let's do two more examples, see if you really understand this. So the first one is I want you to interpret a relative risk of 0 0.8. Pause the video, come up with your answer, restart to see how I answered it. So what did you get? So what I got is a relative risk of 0 0.8 means that risk of the outcome in the exposed group was reduced by 20% or occurred 20% less relative to the unexposed group. Remember that 1 minus relative risk is 0.2 or 20%. How do you interpret this one? A relative risk of 3.3. Pause the video, restart to see what my answer is. So what did you get? Well, what I got was the risk of the outcome in the exposed group was increased by 230% relative to the unexposed group. An alternative interpretation is that the risk of the outcome was 3.3 times greater in the exposed group relative to the unexposed group. So again, using that formula from the previous slide will give you uh, this 230%. But one thing you have to keep in mind is I keep using the term relative risk, and it is all relative. So a relative risk of 3 means you're 3 times more likely to develop the outcome if you're exposed than if you're not. But are you impressed by this number? Well, I'm impressed if the patient starts out at a 30% baseline risk and goes up to 90%. But I'm not so impressed if they start out at 0.1% and only go to 0.3%. So the key here is you have to assess baseline risk of your patient, then apply the relative risk to get their final risk of developing an outcome if they're exposed to something. And this is how we use this information in clinical care. It's not that big of a deal if I can interpret a relative risk and odds ratio or calculate it. I have to be able to use it to help take care of my patient. And the next slide will show an example of how this is done. So this is the nurse's health study or, or the data from it. I've deleted out some of the extraneous information to make this a little clearer. And let's focus on this multivariate adjusted relative risk of women who used estrogen and progesterone compared to non-users. So first thing I want to ask you is how do you interpret this relative risk? Pause the video for a second, come up with your answer, then restart to see what I put.
So how I interpret it is that the risk of major cardiovascular disease was 61% less in users of estrogen and progesterone compared to non-users. Same formula from before, one minus relative risk. But let's say I have a, a, a woman sitting in the office who I do a Framingham risk calculator on her, and it, it's determined that she has a 20% chance of having major cardiovascular disease. And I'm trying to decide whether I want to use estrogen and progesterone or not. So now what I want you to do is take her baseline 20% risk and use this information from the nurse's health study to figure out if she used estrogen and progesterone, what is her final risk of having cardiovascular disease. Pause the video, restart to see how I answered it. So what did you get? This is a complex problem, but a real one of decision making in clinical practice. And so what I need to do is multiply her baseline risk by the relative risk, and I get what her final risk is. And her final risk will be about 8% based on the nurse's health study if she used estrogen and progestins. And that makes sense. It reduced her risk because the relative risk was less than 1. So this is how I would use an observational study to help me take care of a patient. I would take their baseline risk and... This Framingham risk calculator is a prediction rule, so it's best to use something like a prediction rule to figure out baseline risk and multiply it by that of the risk found in the study to get your patient's final risk. That's clinically how we use this information. So what about an odds ratio? Often physicians interpret it the same as a relative risk, though technically it's quite different. And an odds ratio, again, is a ratio. And it's a ratio of the odds of exposure in those with disease or cases divided by the odds of exposure in those without disease or control. So remember, in a case control study, we start with cases who have disease and controls who don't go backwards in time for exposure. So an odds ratio actually estimates the risk of exposure, different than a relative risk. But often physicians interpret it in the same way, which isn't technically correct. And an odds ratio is how many times more likely are the odds of finding an exposure in someone with disease compared to finding that exposure in someone without disease. And an odds ratio 1 means there's no change in the frequency of exposure because the numerator and denominator are the same. Odds ratio greater than 1 means there's increased re risk of fre or increased frequency of exposure among cases. And odds ratio less than 1 means there's decreased frequency of exposure among cases. Again, physicians often use this as a, an assessment of risk of disease. I guess it's okay to think about it that way um, for clinical purposes, but it's not absolutely technically correct. So when should I be impressed by a relative risk or odds ratio? Well, I'm going to give you some rules of thumb as suggested by the authors of the EBM Bible. And in a randomized control trial, because it's the least prone to bias, you would be satisfied with fairly small increases or decreases in relative risk. But in a cohort study, which is more prone to bias than the relative risk, the number needs to be bigger. My relative risk needs to be at least three or greater for minor adverse events. And things that are significant adverse events, I'll ratchet this back. And in a cohort study, they suggest an odds ratio greater than four to be impressed with. And that's because case control studies are even at greater risk of bias than cohort studies, which are at greater risk of bias than randomized control trials. Again, these are just sort of rules of thumb. The bigger the number, the more impressed you are. Now, when should I believe the relative risk or odds ratio in a study? And, and Professor Les Erwig, who is an epidemiologist um, based in Australia, made this suggestion. First of all, you have to compare an unadjusted or raw relative risk or odds ratio. And often you might have to make this calculation yourself, although sometimes the authors of a study will report it. And you want to compare that to the odds ratio or relative risk that was adjusted for at least one known confounder. Now, if this adjustment produces a large decline in the odds ratio of relative risk, be very suspicious that this is a spurious association and not real. On the other hand, if adjustment increases the relative risk or odds ratio or it remains stable, you can be confident that this is a valid association. And when I mean adjustment increases or, you know, comparing yours to the adjusted one is what I'm talking about in these two statements. So let's see a, a real life example of this. This again is the results from the nurse's health study. And I first have to calculate my um, unadjusted or raw relative risk because both of these reported here are adjusted. And the way you do that is just divide or first calculate the incidence of 
major cardiovascular disease in the women who used estrogen is just 8 divided by this 27,161. And I divide that by the incidence or probability of developing the outcome in women who were never exposed is just 431 divided by this number. And when you do that, you get 0 0.208. And when I compare that to age-adjusted, that's not too different. I'm fairly satisfied at this point of that this might be a real association. But look what happens when I compare it to the multivariate adjusted. Huge changes in risk. So a huge reduction in the estimate of risk. And the reason I say reduction is even though this number is greater than this, remember one minus relative risk. This is actually a smaller reduction. So I'm really worried that this is a spurious association and not real. And I made a previous video about residual confounding that gives some reasons why this might be a spurious association. And you might want to look at that. This video has helped you understand how to interpret an odds ratio and a relative risk and how to apply it in patient care. Remember, if you have any questions, you can contact me through the course website or through the contact me section of my blog. Have a great day.